Hey guys, King Gath here and welcome to Bethesda Mod School. In this lesson, I'm going to show you how to make a quest repeatable. So in our case, it's just going to be what we would call a radiant quest. And if you think that's a bad word, you still might want to learn this. There are definitely other uses aside from radiant quest for making quests repeatable. For example, the raid system built into Fallout 4 relies on repeatable quests. It just means that the, the quest itself and everything that it does can happen multiple times. And so it's a useful little tool to have in your in your arsenal. In our case, I think it's uh, useful to just make radiance just as there are like a great content filler. You can do things like bounty boards with them. You can set up something like a faction grind reputation type system if you wanted to, where you have to do so many favors for somebody to earn their way. I think there are definitely uses outside of just the typical uh, negative the radiance that people feel pretty negatively about having to repeat the same thing. I think there are great ways to use them. So let's uh, go ahead and get this set up. So there's a few things we've got to do. Um, first up, you'll see I took our previous mod and I just renamed the, uh, the quest, but it should otherwise be exactly the same as the 104 one we built in the last tutorial on the quest making kit, uh, quest making set. So uh, we got to do a couple things here. First, we're going to go to the quest data tab and we're going to uncheck run once. So generally you want run once to prevent the game from accidentally starting your quests again. But obviously in this case, we are actively trying to make a quest we can repeat. The next thing we need to do is we need to stop the quest after it's finished. So by default, whenever a quest is running, it can't then start again. You'll notice that you never will see the same quest pop up in your log twice with the exact same name. And that's because the first one is generally running. And so we need to stop it. And it's very easy to do that. We just simply go down in our little script here. We're going to go to our last stage after the complete all objectives. And we just use stop with uh, left and right parentheses. So we go ahead and compile that. And now our quest is configured so that it can repeat multiple times. Now I'm also going to, while I'm in here, I want to show you guys how to do uh, make another little couple of tweaks to this quest just to make this more interesting give you another tool for your tool belt so we're going to go ahead and change it so our item is actually dynamic as well so to do that we're going to go to uh, leveled items here and we're going to go ahead and create a new one and leveled items are a, an immensely complicated topic but for this case, you can actually just use them as ways to randomly select an item. So we're going to go ahead and just put in a random quest item here. Uh, and then we need to add some items into right here. So we're going to just go into items, misc item, and we're going to type in a scrap. And we're going to just grab all these scrap items and you don't have to obviously select a group you can just grab one item uh, and basically what will happen here is now it'll just randomly select one from the list so if we hit preview calculated results see it first time it gets oil next time it gets gears uh, and that was just a group i knew i could grab easily so we're going to just make that our random quest item and then we change this blowtorch we wait for our alias screen, which is nice and slow, and we just change it to point to that. Now, you'll see a lot of Bethesda items always start with leveled list with uh, LL in there, and I should have done that, but uh, we're going to call this uh, uh, random quest object. And I want to copy this to my clipboard because we're actually going to update our uh, objective using the alias system that we sh I showed you guys how to show do the location. We'll go ahead and do it for our object as well, so that way they can see what it is that we're getting. So random quest item. Oh, almost forgot. In order to uh, make an alias's name be able to show up in things like objectives, we got to remember to check in the stores text button, which is what lets it store the string for that in this to be accessible. So we'll hit stores text. And now that will be able to work when we use it in the objective. We hit OK here and we go back to our objectives. And instead of get the blowtorch, we're going to do the same thing we did for the alias random dungeon. We're going to go alias equals random quest object. And so now we've got, uh, now our radiant will seem a little bit more dynamic. So instead of always grabbing the blowtorch over and over again, now they'll grab a random piece of junk. Um, now, obviously there are, uh, th the player might try and build with that. I don't know how the game handles if a quest item is a component that could be scrapped. I don't know how the game handles that, but that's fine. We, generally you wouldn't do that. You would have a selection of quest items that actually mean something, but I didn't want to dig through and find those. So I just knew I could grab those at a, a, a glance. But the whole point there is uh, you can use a leveled item as just a way to generate a random object. It's a really powerful little feature of leveled items. So we're going to save here. 
All right, so the next thing we got to deal with is that our method for triggering our quest is kind of wonky for what we're trying to do here. We want to give the player a little more control. And I want to explain a few different things because this will teach you some stuff about how these trigger boxes work and how those default scripts we've been using work. So we're going to start by hiding all the other layers so we can just see what we're working with here. So the first thing we got to talk about is right now our quest trigger is for the player to walk into this box. So now I want to wa walk you through, just think about the scenario of how this will play out. We will walk into this box, we'll get our quest, then we'll run off to a dungeon, kill a guy, grab our item, come back and ring the bell. Well, if you think about it, when we, and let's see if I can get this to show up here. Uh, where's the workshop at? There it is. Uh, when we come in to ring this bell here, no matter what, we're going to be inside of this trigger box. Well, the way trigger boxes work is that they will fire their script as you pass through the box, but they will not just continue to fire just because you're standing inside. So we'll walk up, we'll hit the bell, our quest will complete, and now if we want to start it again, we have to walk out and walk back in. Obviously, that's we want to give the player a little more control over that, and uh, we want it to be a little more intuitive. So I'm thinking we'll just make a button. So I searched for butt up here and that gave me a bunch of buttons. I think so we're gonna just drop a button and uh, have them push it to start the quest rather than having it walk through this trigger box. Now, there's another little issue we've got to deal with and that's that these scripts here that we've been using. Now we used this time, we on this one we used default ref on trigger enter. Last episode we also used a new script that was a, one of these default ones but it was default alias that we put on one of the aliases. And those are great except for the fact that they are are incapable of repeating stages so whenever you run these they will basically look and see if the stage on a quest has been set in the past and if so it won't do it again and that obviously is a problem when we're trying to repeat the quest so we're gonna have to write our own versions of these so I've come up with some very super simple scripts that I think even those of you guys who don't like scripting, uh, I think if you've been able to handle the fragments so far, you'll be able to handle these. And if not, I'll include all these scripts that I've written in the Bethesda Mod School resources so that you can grab a hold of those and just reuse them exactly. And uh, that should sate most of you guys, but I think it's worth learning. I think if you're going to do quest design, you're gonna have to do a little bit of scripting. And so I would also highly recommend if you haven't already, go through my scripting series on Papyrus, which is also available on this channel. All right, so now we've got a little script here and one little piece of it is a little complicated, but hopefully I can get it in a way you guys can follow along even if you don't have much scripting experience. But if you're having trouble following along, definitely go check check out my scripting series. I'll take a lot more time in that to make sure you guys understand this even if it's uh, even if you don't have a lot of programming experience or zero programming experience. I try to get it to the the lowest level I can without trying to teach all programming logic from scratch, but uh, that it should be something that any of you guys interested in making quests, you're also going to want to learn some basic programming uh, and it's it's way less intimidating than it probably seems to do so all right so the anatomy of a script here real basics uh, up top here is we're determining the name of our script and what type of thing it can go on and then here we've got our properties and properties are what you set up in the creation kit so the quest this is we've done this before we did this on some of those default scripts where we pointed it to our quest and determined what stage we want to set and then here's where i did something different and this is this is the one thing that's a little bit complicated in here so whenever you have an integer let's say we removed this negative one here uh, if we if the if the user of our script so whoever was setting it up in the creation get in this case ourselves if we didn't put a value to this it would be assumed to be zero that's kind of a secret default value for integers well we don't want that we want to make sure that um, uh, zero is not set to this automatically so we're going to determine what value we want to set and the reason we don't want this to be zero is because zero is a legitimate quest stage so it could be that the person who sets this up, who uses our script, wants it to be zero. We wanna know, is, is stage zero done on our quest? Um, well, if we checked for that, it would by default be true even if the person using it didn't set a stage. So it might be, we don't want any prerequisite stage. Uh, and in that case, we need to set up a scenario where that can be true. So uh, what we're doing here by, by setting this to default to negative one, which is what happens when you put it in the property line. If you put uh, an equal and then you put some sort of value, you're basically saying this should start out and by, by default, it should always be this instead of zero is what we're effectively saying. Um, this way, if we check, in our in our rest of our script, if we check if the value is still negative one, we'll know that whoever used our script didn't want a prereq stage. That's the equivalent of saying, don't use a prereq stage. We just wanna, all we care about is if the, uh, 
uh, if this thing was activated. We don't need any prerequisite stages. And that's so that way by having this value not be zero, we're es essentially allowing someone to skip this field. So this is the most complicated part. If you if you know any programming that should be easy to follow um, or just it's just like a logic thing. But I will, again, include all these scripts with so you can uh, have them until maybe it makes a little more sense and then you can make use of them. So then if we come down here, this is where the meat of our script is. And basically, this is our event we're trying to react to. We're saying like when this object is activated, which is when the player pushes activate on the object, we're going to run this little block of code here. So we're checking is our prereq stage still the default so if it's still negative one that means that they didn't set a prereq stage whoever used the script didn't set a prereq stage so we don't care um uh, what other stage the quest is done to we just want this to happen down here whoops didn't mean to drag and drop that we don't we just want this to happen uh, and this is why there's an or there which is what these two vertical pipes mean so we're saying either this wasn't set in the creation kit it's the default in which case we don't need a we don't care about a prerequisite stage or if instead that is not if this is not true so if this fails to be true then it'll go on to check this side of the double pipes uh, then instead let's check did our quest finish whatever stage i prereq stage is set to so if in the ck we set prereq stage to 10 then when the logic ran it would say does 10 equal negative one which would be false so then it would be like okay there's an or so we can check the other side of that then it would say does this quest have 10 if that is stage 10 done for this quest and if so um, we move into this and we run this here and we set our other stage so uh, this is our little method for making sure that we can um, we can only run this set stage if this prereq is done or if the user never set it to anything in the first place. And if you look, I have a bunch of these other scripts here. They're all set up. And if you see, it looks like nothing's changing because most of the content is identical. So all almost all this stuff can be identical. What changes between them uh, in this first two here, we've got uh, the reference the object reference one that uh, we're going to put on a button that the player can push and then we have the exact same thing but for a reference alias and this goes on the turn in bell so if we go back into the ck and we open up our quest um, you'll see our aliases we have a bunch of scripts on them which we set up in previous tutorials in this same series so if we go into turn in bell you'll see it's got default alias on activate so we need a version for uh, aliases and so we made a version that's exactly the same but has reference alias which means that the script can go on a reference alias then we had a couple of other things we had set. So we had a uh, the random quest object that has our script that is on container change. So we need one of those that doesn't use the default because the default won't allow us to set the stage again. So I went ahead and again, the content is virtually identical. You've got the same properties. You've got this same block of code. One of the differences is in the on container changed is I made sure that this goes to the player. Now the reason for that is when this object spawns there's a chance that it the act of it just being created inside of the container could trigger that event i'm i think most of the time it won't but there's a chance just the way sometimes things can fire off so just to be absolutely certain we just want to make sure that it's the, the player picked it up is what happened in order to trigger our little stage here and then lastly on the boss we have an on death so we're checking to see when that boss died. So we need a copy of that one as well. So we have default alias on death. So I went ahead and created that as well. And again, you can see this content right here is all is exactly the same. What has changed here is I'm using the on death event. So we just changed the event for each of these. And then the one exception where we added a little extra bit was this uh, on container changed. You could do the same thing for uh, on death. You could check if the killer is equal to the player, things like that. There are a lot of things you could do to make these more robust, but I wanted to keep these as simple as possible because I think some of your brains already melted about this prereq stage thing. So, um, And lastly, there's this extra script. This is the original way I was going to implement it, but I realized the script was just too long uh, to bother explaining it to you guys yet, but I will include it in the kit as well in case any of you wants to be able to have a, a repeating trigger that happens when somebody shoots something something or punches it or whatever. So we're going to go ahead and start adding our script on our various objects. I believe I already compiled it off camera here. So uh, let's start by uh, we're going to get rid of our little trigger box here. Uh, and then we will unhide this for a second. And we're going to go ahead and uh, find a button here. And we're just going to drop it in right here. So we'll do uh, CON button stand. 
and we'll go ahead and add our script. I'm going to leave that other script there. That script actually just handles the animation of the uh, of the button, and that's fine. Uh, as you can see, there's two of them that come up. This other one, I try. It turns out there is a uh, character limit of uh, 38 characters for a for a script name, and I had the on container changed one was too long, so I decided to just rename all of them. Um, but we're going to go ahead and add this, and we're going to pick our quest. So I'll just type 105. That should be. There we go. And then we want to set to start it is uh, stage 10. And we don't actually want a prereq. And so that's why we did that negative one thing. So we don't want a prerequisite stage. We just want it to set as soon as the player walks up and pushes that thing. So now the rest of our scripts, we didn't put on any objects. Even though we could have put it on our bell, we put all of them on those aliases. So we're going to open our quest back up. And we're going to start messing with our alias ones. So we're going to go to our turn in bell. And before I remove the scripts, I'm going to double check that and make sure I got the stages right. So we need a prereq stage here of 35, and we're going to set stage 40. And one thing to note, as you saw on that object, you can have multiple scripts on an object. So if you're doing something like this ever where you're transferring to a different script, uh, I recommend just adding the new one first and setting it up. And then that way, if you forget something, what it is, you can always go, you can always close this out and double check on the old script before you remove it. Um, so we determine we need a, a prereq stage of 35. And we want to set stage 40. Now, one of the things on the default scripts they do is on their aliases, they don't actually have a quest set up here. They actually instead use a special function called get owning quest, which you can use to grab the quest that the alias is already on. Uh, but I think this makes it more robust. It's a one extra step we got to do to actually select this quest, but then it makes it so that our object could actually trigger stages on some other quest, which is sometimes useful. So we're going to go ahead and select our quest again. And uh, we'll filter for 105, and we'll hit OK. And since I remembered it all, I can go ahead and remove all that stuff there. And then we'll do the same for our boss, bringing this up. And we're just basically going to be swapping out each of these different ones. So this time we're going to type in uh, KG we've already got. We'll type in death, and there's our set stage on death. And uh, I forgot to look at what stage we're setting, so I'll just hit yes to that. We'll double check, double check that one. Prereq is 10, and we're setting stage 20. So we'll go back in here. Stage to set is 20. Prereq stage is 10. And we'll go on it again. We select our quest. Oops, 105. Okay, and once we got that set up, we can remove our alias on death. And then last, we want to do it to our quest object which I think has the same stage to set. I think it's, oh no, actually it's not 20. Remember we set up that extra stage so we can make sure both objectives happen, but that this is why we check these things. So we're looking for a prereq of 10 and we're gonna set stage 30 this time. So we'll go ahead and add our, this time we'll search for the container one. And our prereq was 10 and we're setting stage 30. And then for our quest, we'll search for 105. And there we go, we can remove this guy and we should be good let's go ahead and save this and i will pop in game and show you that this all works all right we are in game we've got our uh, little button over here so we're gonna go ahead and push this we get our repeating quest sending us off to get the cork from wicked she uh, wicked shipping fleet lockup now uh we could run over there and do this but because they're all using effectively the same script i'm going to trust that uh, it will work as long as we set this so what we're going to do here is we're going to go uh set stage and then we're going to type the name of our quest or the editor id of our quest and we're going to go ahead and type in 35. So what I want to do is show you that the prereq part works of our turn in bell. So we're going to go ahead and hit that. And then we're going to hit ring the bell here. And we should get quest completion. There we go. And we'll let that finish up. And then we'll go ahead and push our button again. As soon as that clears off, wait for that to clear off the UI. Here we go. And there it goes, starts right up again. It's sending us back to Wicked Shipping Fleet Lockup because I didn't actually go clear it. Based on the conditions we have set up, if I went actually over there and cleared it, it would uh, pick somewhere else instead. Um, but if we go back and look in there, I think it said leather. So it, you can see it picked a new dynamic uh, location. You can also see if I go ahead and click this again, 
it doesn't then just repeat the quest because that quest isn't stopped. So it actually has to, while that quest is in my log, it can't just run again. So a repeatable quest doesn't mean that infinite copies of it can run. It just means that that exact quest can run multiple times in a row. So there you go. That is how you set up a repeatable quest. And hopefully that just added some new uh, power to your arsenal. I, I cannot recommend enough for you guys who are interested and you're going this deep into quest making also follow along with the scripting series because there's all sorts of random little things you need to script outside of just the fragments occasionally you run into stuff like this where the default scripts just aren't going to cut it and uh, you might have to write your own custom solution or ask for some help and uh, people like me can help you but we're probably not going to do the whole thing for you so before ending the video, I decided to add one little snippet at the end here, and uh, it's right here. If you look at this script we use for the unactivate, I added another if statement here. If ak activated by equals game dot get player, and the reason I did this is because I think if some of you guys went to use this on a piece of furniture, you might be surprised by the stages triggering randomly, and that's because any NPC interacting with a piece of furniture, so whether it be sitting down in a chair or sleeping in a bed, that's considered an activation, and so you wouldn't want necessarily your stage to uh, trigger that so this makes it so that only the player can do it which is generally what we want and that is part of why Bethesda's version has all those extra bits in it is because they offer you all these different ways that you can configure this from the creation kit without having to mess with your script so their version would have something like should it only be allowed by the player and then this would be an optional check they make their script much more complicated and uh, again once you get into scripting more you can learn from what they're doing and copy a lot of that but I thought I would show you guys this because in the scripts that are going to be packaged with the Bethesda Mod School series, they are going to have this game.get player check that wasn't in the earlier part of the video when I walked you through it. All right, guys, go download the uh, Bethesda Mod School resources zip file. It will have all this stuff in there so that way, if you're not comfortable scripting, you can just reuse what I've done for you already.